What you see before you is not exactly what one would call a game. It's more like an interactive meditation, reenacted from scattered evidence that happened to fall into our hands. It was built according to instructions left by the Archive's anonymous donor. Many strange things and unclear moments you will encounter in this, whatever it is, are due to the requirements outlined in the Archive. Maybe it was just a mysterious hoax, but it probably wasn't. We suggest you view it as just another urban legend. We recommend you play this in a dark and quiet place, alone. Okay, now chances are you haven't heard anything about this game before, and don't understand what the hell I'm talking about right now, unless you deliberately searched for it. But I can safely assume that most of the people watching this video just happened to walk into this randomly in the recommended tab. Or maybe you're one of those few who waits every passing minutes until the release of the next mediocre video essay that I managed to brew up. Either way, let me give you some context and start from the very beginning. Knock Knock is a 2013 survival horror game that was made by an indie Russian studio by the name of Icepick Lodge. And to the three people that may find this name familiar, they are also the the creators of the Pathologic series, which is known for its large difficulty and unforgiving nature. And by difficult and unforgiving, I don't mean it in a Souls games kind of way, where you have to get punished dozens of times until you manage to learn the boss's attack pattern and overcome the challenge. No, 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 no. These games, both Pathologic and Pathologic 2, are specifically made to be depressing, unfair, frustrating, and literal torture to play at times in a good way. There are several other essays here on YouTube that go in depth with this series if you're interested, but in this video we'll be explicitly focusing on Knock Knock. Now with these games being made by the same developers, surely they might have something in common, right? Well, in a way. I mean, of course, the Pathologic series consists of a 3D open world RPG with lots of different approaches on how you can play, dialogue options, complex characters, choices, weapons, and dozens of hours worth of gameplay, while Knock Knock is just a short and simple side-scroller. But at the same time, you can kind of feel the similarities between these games. The atmosphere, the cryptic, confusing, and sometimes grammatically incorrect text, roughly translated from Russian to English, and the frequent moments that the game throws at you which you would think to be unfair. All of this is very much present in Knock Knock, although it may not be as noticeable at first. This game is aimed towards a very specific type of player, which means that people who enjoy a lot of action and cinematic storylines, or something they can have a relaxing, stress-free time with, may not enjoy this game as much as someone who can get easily immersed into a short and simple experience, and is ready to speculate and make theories about the meanings of certain points in the gameplay and storyline without expecting them to be handed in a plate by the developers. This is instantly apparent by reading some of the negative reviews of this game, left by clueless people who either didn't bother to learn the mechanics and get past the second level, or called a repetitive despite the developers warning you that this game isn't really what you expect. And I get it, I mean this game is unusual, it's different, but I think it's different in the best possible way. Which is why I thought I would try to untangle all of the confusions and little mysteries it tries to throw at you, and try to explain why this little game has a lot more to it than it might seem at first. And with that fairly long intro out of the way, my name is Shadow and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into Knock Knock. This story begins in late November of 2011, when the studio received a strange email from an anonymous source which encouraged them to create a game based on a set of materials attached to it. The attachment was an archive named Last Play, and it is unclear whether the spelling mistake was accidental or for some reason on purpose, but the more favorable theory was that the sender simply did spell Let's Play incorrectly. The archive consisted of 19 files that varied from text snippets to audio recordings and video fragments, which the studio claimed to be disturbing. The surface examination did not reveal anything straightforward really terrifying, yet we could not escape the feeling that something truly sinister was lurking underneath. Unbeknownst to them, this same statement would later become an essential part in the core of the game. The stranger in question was begging them to finish this project, as it would quote unquote potentially explain what calamity befell whoever has compiled this ominous archive. So the team began working on this mysterious project, using the limited amount of materials they had at their disposal. They hired a designer who they knew would be able to decipher the different strange ideas presented to them through these different snippets and drawings into some Something that would work consistently with the art direction the game was heading in. They were given no boundaries to their creative freedom by the sender, under the condition that everything inside the last play archive would make its way into the game, else everything would be futile. The game was successfully kickstarted, reaching $41,021 out of a $30,000 goal, and was released on Steam on the 4th of October 2013 and later on mobile and several consoles. Now, before we continue, you might be thinking to yourself, is this really what happened? I mean, why would a small indie studio create such a fuss and raise over 
$40,000 to create a game based on some random person's weird email. It just doesn't seem that believable. So is it real or fake? Well, I don't know. And with this studio, as I may have already established, you never really know. This whole backstory might have simply been made up to promote the game and to add an extra layer of mystery onto it. But every lie contains a bit of truth, so assuming that it was fake, they might have actually been proposed with these ideas by certain colleagues or fans, maybe even through email, but decided that it would be more exciting to write it off as this strange occurrence. Either way, returning to the text at the beginning of the video, it might have been a hoax or it might have even been real. I Speak Lodge themselves encourage you to look at this as an urban legend, so take that as you will. After all, it's fun to speculate, right? There is an unusual cabin deep within the woods. It has served as a laboratory and a dwelling for three generations. But as of late, the current inhabitant has been noticing weird changes in familiar surroundings. Things are missing, noises and rattling are heard. Something odd is coming out of the woods. The game begins with us being introduced to the protagonist, as he wakes up before sunrise and looks at himself through a mirror, while knocking and fumbling is heard all around him. His appearance consists of a messy hairstyle, tired eyes with dark circles around them, a messily put on nightgown and shaking hands holding a lamp. At first glance, this might suggest to us that he's either extremely sleep deprived or mentally unstable, or both. His real name is unknown, he is only referred to as The Lodger by the developers, probably because of the fact that he lives in a, well, lodge and this might also be a nod to Icepick Lodge, the studio's name. Whatever he thinks, he speaks to himself, as it seems to be. And when he does, he always looks at the screen as if breaking the fourth wall. His voice is questionable. <laughs> This house is an observatory. It's an old science station. I've lived here since I was born. My father worked here before I did, before him, my grandfather, and so on. Each one of my predecessors added something to this house, but the past is not a very valuable legacy, which is why many rooms are locked. I never look in there. Lodger's house is massive and has dozens of rooms. It's randomly generated, which means that every level has an entirely different layout. I'm fairly certain that this doesn't have anything to do with the story and is strictly a gameplay mechanic to make the game less repetitive. A large percentage of the rooms have different objects placed around them. Most of them are full of scientific equipment like schemes, telescopes, and different devices, but others may vary from completely normal household objects to downright disturbing contents. Either way, each room is carefully crafted to resemble an old building that is slowly losing itself to time. The game focuses around this house and the forest around it and consists of a cycle of two different levels. The first one is the house level, in which the lodger has to make his way to a clock placed in a random room of the house. After activating it, time moves forward a bit and the front door opens. The lodger heads outside into the forest to do his nightly walk around, and from here on you can either search for the house again to head back in and finish the level, or... Wait a second, is that a child? <laughs> what the f- Finding the little girl in the forest plays a little fragment of reality each time. These are short little scenes with mostly absurd imagery, but they are absolutely crucial for the good endings. And since we're doing a complete analysis of the game, they are also crucial for this video. So after experiencing this weird hallucination, the lodger heads back into his house and falls asleep. He wakes up in the middle of the night, again, or does he? I mean, his house seems to be the same, but it feels a little bit off. It feels like more rooms have been added in, and he's certain that his bed was in a different room when he fell asleep in it. Wait, why are things appearing out of nowhere? Why are the doors shutting in front of him? What exactly is happening here? Well, maybe I can find my answer in that room. I need to go and check. <laughs> the eye level is where the actual gameplay begins. This time, the lodger has found himself in a dream version of his house. And as you can probably tell, this dream isn't a very joyful one. In this level, your goal takes a steep turn. Instead of finding an object placed randomly in the house and heading outside, you simply have to survive until sunrise while being visited by deformed creatures called guests. So uh, how do you survive? Well, the core mechanics stay the same. You roam around your house, switching on any lights along the way and scouting the territory. But there are a few new tools that you gain access to which will help you live. For example, almost every time the lodger enters a room in the dream world, he will close his eyes. And if you stand still, random objects will start appearing after a few seconds. It takes about three seconds for a clock to appear and about eight or nine for anything else. If you've noticed, time actually moves forward here instead of standing still, which I always thought was weird since these levels are supposed to be the paranormal Normal ones. I guess it's just another gameplay feature since it's common for survival games to have you surviving until sunrise, or to a certain moment in 
time. As for the normal world, each clock you find in the house levels does actually move time forward a little bit permanently, which later adds up towards the end of the game to show how close you are to the ending. But the more important thing out of this, however, is that clocks are by no means less useful in the dream world. No, they are literally your best friends. Their use is simple, but is very beneficial towards your survival. Interacting with one moves time ahead a fair bit, as expected. But here, they spawn at random, which means that you can get a few of them in a row and basically speedrun the whole level. But if the lodger closes his eyes for longer than 3 seconds in a room, then it's usually not worth the extra wait. All it does is spawn in random objects from the environment, usually with a wicked twist to them. Some of these objects can be hidden behind, although hiding in this game isn't a very optimal strategy, since time goes backwards when you're doing it, and if you get spotted you will also suffer another time loss. Just stick to ladders, honestly. But who are we hiding from anyway? Who are these mysterious guests that keep creeping in, and what do they want from us? Well, there are two types of guests that appear exclusively in the I slash dream levels, the hiding guests and the seeking guests. The hiding guests spawn in any dark room behind you by themselves and are stationary. They don't attack you, although they can sometimes block you from reaching certain parts of the house. Walking into them will set back time a bit, but attempting to fix the light bulb in the room that they are in will instantly break it, set back time even further, and teleport you into an entirely different room. The only way to effectively get rid of them is to simply wait for them to disappear, which they will do themselves unless you're staring in their direction. The two most common types of these guests are an entity with a box on their head and a similar one but covered in leaves instead. However, there are a few more less common guests I would put under this category that usually appear at the end of the game, like these weird objects with faces on them faintly resembling the lodgers. The seeking guests, on the other hand, can only appear through a breach. Every once in a while, lightning will flash in a random room, and the camera will briefly zoom in towards the location. The light bulb in that particular room will break, even if it was switched off. If you fail to arrive and start fixing the light in that particular room within about 10 seconds, a breach will emerge. These have an appearance of the very same eye the level icon presents to you. When inside a room with a breach in it, wind will whistle, supposedly implying that whatever this is, it must be coming from outside, from the forest. The only way to keep the breach from spawning in the seeking guest is to seal it down as soon as possible by fixing the lights in that particular room, preferably before the eye itself opens, as sealing it down while an eye is active sets back time a bit. Every breach has a chance of spawning in at least one seeking guest on each floor, and if a guest despawns, a new one will shortly take its place. Up to three breaches may appear on a level at the same time, potentially spawning several seeking guests across several floors. The guests in question consist of a headless, dropped down, limping being that happens to have a prosthetic leg, and walks from one side of a floor to the other, a chained ghost flying around in the same pattern as the previous guest, a rolling ball of branches and leaves that slowly moves towards the player, a group of what seems to be flying candles, a roaming version of the lodger's bed, the infamous doppelganger who is essentially a carbon copy of the lodger. He can either be neutral, just going around and switching off the lights, or become very aggressive and start following you in a familiar yet unpredictable pattern. He is faster than the lodger himself and can also move up and down stairs. The strange thing about him, however, is that in contrast to the lodger himself, who speaks in complete gibberish, the doppelganger is actually able to speak, although I wouldn't call his voice normal. Finally, I'm back. Walking into an aggressive doppelganger will set back time quite a bit, as normal. However, if you walk into a neutral doppelganger, this happens instead. And the creepiest seeking guest award probably goes to this guy. He is pretty rare, thankfully. As you can see, his body is completely deformed into this amalgamation as he walks around on his arms, with an extra pair sticking around. These twisted beings are extremely fast and can also climb up ladders. The final guest I will talk about is the invisible one. Rarely, especially in the later levels, you may see handprints and footprints appearing on certain walls, not to be confused with the rooms that already have them. If this guest gets close to you, it will drastically set back time, usually resulting in a level restart. So try to stay clear of them at all costs. In my opinion, the beauty with how this game presents its enemies is in the fact that it doesn't try to scare you with cheap jump scares. Instead, it drags you in with its unsettling atmosphere, waits until you get immersed, and slowly creeps up on you. On the third house level, the lodger loses his diary. It must mean a lot to him since he seems very troubled about it, and that no matter what happened, he must find it immediately.
Yes, that is an actual spelling mistake in this cutscene and it is still in the game to this day. My old man gave me this diary when I was first learning how to write. He said that I would write my entire life down in it, and that with the last page of the notebook, my life would end as well. He was last in our family who was fond of speaking in metaphors. I was very young then and took his words literally. I wanted to live a long life so I rationed the pages. I wrote only in my smallest handwriting, rarely and briefly. It became a habit, but after a while I forgot his words. For some reason they've come back to me now, and they unsettle me. After this cutscene, pages of the Lodger's diary become scattered around each of the remaining levels. They are optional, but in our case, they are also crucial for finding out all the details about the story. I'm especially talking about the ones in the house levels, so switching on the lights in every room will become a priority from now on. As mentioned by the Lodger, the pages barely have any writing on them, and the handwriting itself, which the Lodger recognizes to be his own, is small. But looking at the contents of the pages, can we be sure that these were written by the Lodger himself? I often addressed the diary entries to myself, to my older self, who one day would read these entries. It was just a game, but now I feel that a complete stranger has penned these pages. The handwriting is made to look like mine, but it's a little bit off. I didn't write this, that's for sure. I don't get it. Why did I write this in my sleep? What does it even mean? In addition to all of this, the girl from the forest will sometimes start talking to you in a playful manner, and I'm still not sure if she's trying to help or just taunt you. Stay where you are. Is this other than the increase in difficulty, amount of guests, and size of the levels themselves, the gameplay cycle essentially stays the same, at least that is until the seventh night in the real house. As you enter this level and zoom out, you are greeted by a massive version of either the mysterious girl from the forest or a giant monster, depending on if you collected the required amount of reality fragments before this level or not. As well as this, a sanity bar appears at the top of the screen, and all I can say is that this is where things start to escalate. Remember how at the start of the video I mentioned that this game is, in a way, similar to some of the other projects of Icepick Lodge, mainly pathologic? I mean, the first half of the game already shows us some of that atmosphere and messy, confusing text that their games like to share, but the second half of the game offers something much worse, something that makes you certain that this studio really wants their players to suffer. From this point on, the game quickly changes from a slow-paced, cautious exploration to an exhausting race against time, and all of this is mainly because of two simple factors. First off, that sanity bar I mentioned quickly becomes the bane of your existence. Well, at least in my case it did. It slowly depletes during every remaining dream level, and contrary to popular belief, it doesn't go down further upon coming in contact with a guest or anything for that matter. Although the more you set back time, the longer a level will last, which in turn will deplete the bar even more. So not only do the levels get progressively more difficult, and the difficulty itself is essentially focused around RNG, now you're basically on a timer as well, and trust me, you don't want that timer to run out. Second of all, the forest levels now have these roots or nerves closing in from the corners of the screen, same as the ones that appear when you close a breach or walk into a guest, except these ones don't go away. In fact, if they manage to reach the middle of the screen before you enter back into your house, well, the same thing happens as with the sanity bar. But what exactly? Before I answer that question, let us move forward along the spiral of levels, and potentially Lodger's insanity as well. There were a couple of small things that I didn't mention in this section of the video, like the abyss, or in other words, the endless hallways. That's simply because I didn't find any good place to fit them in, as they're not really that important. For those who are curious, however, these hallways can be entered through two ways. First off, a randomly spawning locked door in dream levels that keeps banging and takes a suspiciously long time to open, which the lodger comments on saying that something is calling him from the other side. Or secondly, you can enter them through a breach. That's right, you can actually enter breaches by interacting with them the same way you would with clocks or hiding places. I'm pretty sure the main goal of these hallways is to give another chance for the player to get reality fragments if they miss the girl in the forest a couple of times. These hallways have randomly spawning doors that can be entered. They have a chance of, like I said, either playing a reality fragment, or leading you into another set of hallways, restarting the level altogether, or teleporting you into the forest, which will eventually result in a level restart as well. Also, after spending some time in these weird overlapping corridors, the lodger's pupils disappear, essentially turning him into a copy of the doppelganger. But this is just a temporary visual effect. And one more note is that the creeping roots slash veins are also present here in the second part of the game. So entering them isn't such a wise idea unless you're missing some reality fragments, but you still want to get the good ending. The remaining levels in the second part of the game are spread further apart from each other on the timeline than the levels from the first part. The game comes to a conclusion with a total of 10 I slash dream levels and 11 house slash real world levels. On the final house,
house level, the lodger has an important decision to make, a decision that will seal his fate. The game has two main endings, if we're judging based on Steam achievements, but technically I would say that there are four. So, returning to that question from before, what happens if the sanity bar runs out, or if the root slash nerves reach the middle of the screen? In this case, the lodger succumbs into madness, and is shown in a cutscene, kneeling down and holding onto his head. His eyes are red. The sounds of creaking floorboards and the clanging of bells is heard in the background. Game over. After this cutscene, well, everything goes back to normal. The sanity bar and the objects slowly crawling on your screen disappear, and nothing bothers you anymore, except until you reach the final house level, that is. After activating the final clock, the front door opens, as usual. But if you try to head outside, the same cutscene plays, over and over again. Pressing continue only sends you back to the beginning of the level, and each attempt to continue forward results in the same outcome. The lodger is stuck in an endless loop of insanity, unable to make a decision and make a step forward. The recent series of nerve-wracking events he has experienced have finally taken a toll on him and pushed him over the edge. Time does not proceed further. This is Knock Knock's unofficial worst ending. If you manage to survive with your nerves intact, but fail to collect at least six reality fragments before the seventh house level, the monster behind the house will keep moving closer, until he is right behind it on the final night. Upon activating the final clock, a cutscene plays. The lodger is shown looking at himself through a mirror, just like a the beginning of the game. All the windows in his house have been boarded up. A hammer and nails are seen lying on the floor. The sun is barely peeking in through the cracks. The lodger has made his decision. He believed that all the evil he had seen was coming from outside, from the forest, and that his house protected him from it. But in reality, his life in isolation and his stubbornness were the ones that brought him to this point. He will forever be trapped in his own house, in his own head, paranoid. Pagurian chose to lock the lodger inside the cabin and remain hidden. If you manage to survive with your nerves intact, and having experienced at least 6 reality fragments before the 7th house level, instead of the monster, the girl from the forest will keep moving closer from behind the house, and will also stand right above you on the final night. Upon activating the final clock, a different cutscene plays. This time, the lodger is shown staring outside one of his windows, the hammer, nails, and wooden planks laying on the floor. The lodger walks out from his front door, for the last time. The little girl from the forest is shown in normal form, smiling as always. The lodger has made his decision. He has freed himself from his house and chose to listen to the forest instead. His old habitat gets overgrown with bare trees along with his past. Breaking the cycle, chose to go into the woods. But wait, 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 what's up with the fourth ending? Well, there is one guest who I didn't mention in the initial list. That guest is the weeping one. She only appears in the eye levels of the second part of the game, after about one minute of real time. You'll know she's in the house when you hear constant weeping coming from a random room. She wears a dirty rag and sits in the corner with her face turned away. Upon approaching her, she either disappears, leaving you a note, or shows her disfigured face, which sends back in game time a bit like any other guest would. For this ending, you will need to collect a total of three three notes from her across three different levels in the second part of the game, as well as complete all the requirements for the good ending on top of this. When you reach the final night, the cutscene is the same as with the good ending, but with a key change. As the lodger heads outside, his house gets overgrown with flowers and greenery instead of bare dead trees. The forest comes alive again, as well as the lodger in a sense. So even though we've looked at pretty much what the game has to offer in terms of gameplay, the story is still very vague and unclear. There are still some questions that have to be answered, and some bits and pieces that have to be put in their places. So in this part of the video, I will examine some of the text slash dialogue in this game, because there's still quite a bit to look at. And combined with different theories and clues, I'll try to piece together what I think would be the meaning behind Knock Knock's story, and if it has any at all. So let's start off with a quick recap. The Lodger is a sleep-deprived, isolated, and mentally unstable person who can't fall asleep one night because of the constant knocking and shuffling around his giant house. He does his nightly walk around in the forest around it, and then either heads back after experiencing weird imagery and not believing what he has seen, or heads back without seeing it at all, depending on your ending. He wakes up in a warped version of his house, in which everything is different and a bit off. He keeps getting chased by seemingly unreal beings that he believes are coming from the outside. He survives, and the cycle repeats. On the third night in the real world, he loses his journal, and starts searching for it, finding ripped pages with contents he doesn't recognize. As the nights start taking a toll on him, his sanity starts to decline. As things get desperate, he finally realizes that the notes seem to be trying to tell him something, and he is faced with a decision. Should he listen to the forest, or should he listen to himself? The most common theory I've seen people make about the story 
story is that all of this is just a metaphor, and honestly, I thought so too at first, simply because it's the easiest assumption to make. I mean, it fits perfectly, right? Someone who has mental health issues, the lodger, holding on to his past, the house, until he finally realizes how to let it go with the help of someone or something, the girl in the forest and the reality fragments, or tries to hold on to it and eventually goes mad, the Pagurian ending. It's really easy to just let your imagination do the work for you and ignore all the clues and information that is right in front of you. That's right, right in front of you. Take a look at the lodger's hands. He is holding a lamp. Notice anything strange? No? Now take a look at his hands in the dream levels. That's right, the lamp is replaced by a candle. However, the most important part about this is in the forest part of the house levels. He is holding a candle as well. This implies that his nightly walkarounds were actually also all in his sleep. But how can I prove this? Well, the dream levels, as we saw, all had guests and paranormal things happening inside of them. And in the second part of the game, the forest levels also have hiding guests appearing around the place as well, along with the mysterious girl, of course. But in the house levels, no nothing paranormal really happens. The lodger didn't need to remember objects in any of the rooms, they were all there. They were also all fairly normal household objects for a scientist, there were no guests around either. The only things that I would call out of the ordinary are some of the sounds coming from around the house, the mysterious notes that were somehow scattered all over the place, and the giant version of the girl slash monster that appears behind you on the seventh house level. Most of these occurrences can be brushed off as a gameplay feature or a symptom of the lodger's insomnia, but there might be another possible reason for some of these events that we'll come back to in a moment. My point is, the house is real. The lodger lives in this house. This is all actually happening. It's not just simply a metaphor. But right now, let's delve into a little backstory. And I've got to admit, there might be something else that I didn't mention earlier on. So at around the fifth house level, if instead of activating the clock, you head towards the closed front door, the game will straight up give you a series of 11 whole notes with lots of necessary backstory. And the thing is, there are little to no hints towards this. You either figure it out yourself by reading some of the few super vague random short notes scattered all around the place, or just accidentally walk into the door I guess. Anyway, so what are these notes about? The first time we learned about the program was in the fall, about six months after the unrest. They described it as a community initiative. Most of the tenants gathered in the courtyard of our complex. No one knew what was going on. Everyone was shouting, worried and guessing what will come next. All kinds of rumors. It came down to this, they would be removing children, as if from unfit parents. For what purpose, who knew? But against the backdrop of everything our government has done and justified in recent years, the outlook was most sinister. At that point, I decided to grab my son and escape the city, to the middle of nowhere. First news about the program. First, the summons arrives, and they announce a gathering, usually at a school. Then the door knockers come, young bastards like volunteers, wearing some party insignia. They go through the complex with lists and check who shows up and who doesn't. I'm not the only one getting clever. Everyone is getting ready to leave for somewhere. We've already been given another family's furniture to look after. Everything is changing. Parents are hiding their kids with other people, so now we have two more. I don't leave my child's side for even a minute. Even in my sleep, I hold his hand. The other children sleep with us too. It's crowded. The world is falling apart. Seems to me this situation is headed for civil war. I had a nightmare that our turn came. We were led to the school, shoved into what used to be the gym. My son and I sat in a cell with a small barred window. I tried to push him through the opening. From the other side came shouts that any kid they catch would be taken unconditionally. There is no suffering worse than this feeling of helplessness. The sixth page is missing. It's past the time where I should leave this apartment, but concern for the children stops me. Stumbling around like a sleepwalker, I don't recognize the thing. They took the little ones. I haven't seen them for at least two days. I suddenly found another child in a corner. Whose is it? No one knows. It sits in the corner wrapped up in a blanket. Doesn't show his face. Doesn't say a word. Sometimes I think it may be a girl. I won't drink anymore. All I can think about is my little invisible one. Doesn't eat or speak. I'm not pressing. Don't even want to watch. Let it keep playing hide and seek. The child is like clothes with nothing inside. Doesn't take food. But all those kids, they forage for themselves. Somehow, little by little, they've learned to look after themselves. Most likely all I need to do now is just love her, and eventually she'll show herself. Maybe it's a boy after all. It started to make little noises from inside his blanket cocoon. Odd squeaks and croaks. It still turns away, but at least now it's reacting to me. It seems like it's really invisible. It tries to reach out and touch me from time to time, but there are no hands there, only emptiness. Maybe she escaped from the program. Is that what they're doing to our kids? I shouldn't be thinking about it. I don't want to. Found the bedding on the invisible's bed, crumbled and tossed about as if in disgust. I gently asked why. It only creaked out something about how the bed smells
smells bad. I took it out for a walk. It's a dry autumn, lots of scent in the air. We picked berries and leaves and I asked which smells it likes. Silence. It accepts nothing. And then it lets me know that it wants to get something to show me. I let it go. The city is almost deserted now, why not let it run around a bit? There is no child in the house, but on the bed I found what it brought back for me. Strange selection. A few shriveled maple leaves, all mixed up with wet dirt, as if it scooped them up from the ground in cupped hands and carried them home folded in its clothes. Now all these rags have to be washed. Whether I want to or not, I'll have to see what's hidden inside, but I think I can already guess. We became strangely close in the weeks that we spent together. These pages are confusing at first, but with the help of this new information that most of the people playing this game wouldn't even notice or care about in the first place, we can piece together an actual story that the game is weirdly trying to tell us. So let's tackle the questions one by one. First of all, who is the author of these pages? Well, the notes begin by putting a big emphasis on the program, and that the person who wrote them was scared that he would lose his son. The lodger has presumably been living in his house his whole life, he openly mentions this, and his words show no further proof of knowledge of the outside world. It really does feel like he means it. So safe to say that it's highly unlikely that a person like the lodger, who has lived in complete isolation his whole life, most of it completely alone too, would have a son. The author also mentions that it's past the time that he should leave this apartment, meaning that the author is still in the outside world, in a town or city while writing these pages. This brings me to the very likely conclusion that the lodger's father is indeed the author of this journal. But let me put everything in its place. He lived in the outside world with his son before things started going bad. The lodger himself was very young at the time, which is why he only remembers being in this house. We don't know how exactly he got here, but we know that the lodger made it safely into this house and has lived here in isolation ever since. But we have one confusing part on page 7. It says that the little ones were taken away. This can include the lodger, seeing as he's, well, right here in front of us. This also can include the invisible child, because they get introduced right after this part of the note. So the only other assumption here is that the children that were taken away were the ones that were left with the lodger's father in the first place by other parents, as mentioned before this. But there might be something else to this. He lost me when I was very little, then he lost his mind, he stopped seeing me. The notes given by the weeping guest are a follow-up to the events in the diary. It shows a bit more of the lodger's father going insane. Due to all of the stress because what was going on in the outside world, he might have simply started forgetting that he had a son in the first place, maybe even experiencing hallucinations from time to time. During his time with the invisible child, he became strangely close with them. They wanted to show him the smells that they liked, which were the smells of maple leaves. He later found a pile of sad leaves in the house. Someone had carried them back. The final note ends with the lodger's father saying that he'll eventually have to check the dirty rags, and that he could already guess what was inside. Was the child dead? First, he got caught up in speculations about what happened to the child. Even if they would have wandered away, a small child wouldn't last very long outside by themselves, without food and water and the like. After this, he eventually stopped believing that the child existed in the first place, that it all simply couldn't be. Does that remind us of anyone? After this incident, at times where he was still in his own mind, he might have influenced his son, the lodger, with this rationalistic thinking. And, in addition to this, he might have taught him to be afraid of the outside world, that it would only bring misery into his life. Due to what he was forced to experience with the program, he focused on his work, and later on, so did the lodger. It was scientific work, and it only fueled their way of thinking even further. Further. They both stopped believing in anything out of the ordinary. I really love having guests over. There was a time when little forest things would come to visit, and sometimes I even made dinner for lost wanderers. I would set the table and pass the time in a conversation with them in my head. That's when I realized that more than anything in the world, I'm afraid of the invisible. So who is the invisible child? A child. Could there have been a child here? I can't recall. No, I can't remember anymore. I'm always forgetting things. There are two creatures in this game that one would describe as childlike. The first one is the weeping guest, but along with all the other guests, she is simply a figment of the lodger's imagination, a twisted interpretation of something from his past or present. For example, in early prototypes, the prosthetic leg and the chained one both had heads, which were removed later in development for some reason. One of them just might resemble a creepy version of the lodger's mentally damaged father, and the other, older looking one, his grandfather even. But what does the weeping guest represent? A version of the mysterious invisible child, perhaps? Maybe, but we can't be sure. In fact, we can't even be sure of what some of the other guests represent either. The important part here is that she doesn't exist, and that's the end of it. She can't be the invisible child. Think of her as a secret optional guest who provides you with useful information from the lodger's past. So, who does that leave us with? That's right, the girl from the forest. She is the invisible child. The lodger used to interact and maybe even play with the invisible child when he was little. This explains why he faintly remembers her in the first place. 
This also explains the rules of hide and seek that are briefly shown at the end of each level, piece by piece. It was a game that they used to play. So as the lodger got older, got even more focused on his scientific work, and most importantly, got caught up in his rationalism, he simply forgot and even denied the existence of the girl altogether, along with everything else he has experienced. In his eyes, as well as his father's, she died a long time ago, and there was nobody else in the dying forest. One thing to note is that each time you gather a reality fragment in the forest, the lodger doesn't actually see the invisible girl. In fact, he might not even be able to see all the other guests in the dream levels either, evident by some of the things he says when bumping into them. <laughs> He might feel or hear something in his dream, but he doesn't specifically see anything, except his house being unusual, uncanny, and things being out of place. The only thing that he does see is the vague imagery that the girl in the forest shows him, reminding him of his own past through cryptic bits and pieces. So with that out of the way, there is only one loose end that still stands, and this kind of brings me to a crossroads. The final question to tie up the story, is the girl the only thing that is capable of saving the lodger even alive? Well, the timeline in this game is kind of confusing. On one hand, there is a lot of evidence towards the fact that she is, in fact, alive, but on the other hand, there might be some evidence towards her being dead, and both of those theories sort of contradict each other. So let's try to put everything in its place. When the lodger's father checked under the rags, she was gone, not dead. This is evidenced by the notes that are given by the weeping guest. He was asking himself where she might have been buried. This implies that he couldn't actually find her anywhere, and started speculating on what could have happened to her. He needed answers on why she disappeared. The maple leaf she left was sort of like a parting gift, and an answer to his previous question on what smell she liked. She went on to explore the forest, and might have never returned. Only a distant memory of her appears in the lodger's dreams, from when they were both children. Unlike the guest, she isn't depicted as something terrifying. In fact, subconsciously, she is the only thing about the outside world that his mind ever pictured as positive, like a bright light in the darkness. He doesn't realize it at first, but holding on to these memories is the only way he can realize the truth and get out of the situation he has placed himself in. This is a bittersweet theory, and honestly I like it a lot. But then, what explains the scattered notes? Or the room in his real house with childish drawings, footprints, and guess what? a dirty rag. These aren't my words, these are my thoughts. This has nothing to do with sleepwalking. Whatever it is, it is flesh and blood. Someone else is inside my home. Someone is staring at me from outside, constantly. What do you want? What, is there something wrong with me? The second theory, a more complex, but more interesting and less philosophical one, suggests that she is actually alive. The lodger's mind portrays her as a child, but that's simply how he last saw her, before his father made him believe that she didn't exist at all. For all we know, she might even be the same age as the lodger during the time of the game's events. In this case, we don't exactly know how she got into the house, and once again I'm blaming this on the timeline. But in the case that she did wander off, the diary does mention the kids fending for themselves, so that's exactly what she might have done. She got accustomed to the forest, learned to live free and enjoy the wilderness. When the lodger and his father escaped to this cabin, she might have even followed them, playing her own game of hide and seek. The scattered notes couldn't have been written by the lodger, even if he was sleepwalking, because they simply aren't his thoughts. He recognizes that. The girl was the one who took the diary, and decided to play another sort of game with him, hiding the pages around. Since he couldn't physically see her, the only way to communicate with him was through these notes. This theory also explains the existence of the room with the drawings and the dirty rag. Maybe this place was inhabited by her when she decided to visit him. This also explains some of the noises coming from around the house every now and then. She often enters and exits, or just scuffles around. All of the other ambience is probably just part of the lodger's fear of what he thinks is outside. His imagination makes up these sounds, presumably made by the horrors roaming around the forest, on their way to get him. I'm sick. I'm so sick. Why do I keep seeing all these things when I look outside? Nothing like that could ever be out there. It's against the laws of nature. It can only be the dying forest out there. The dark, grim, dying forest. I know. Some believe what they see, others see what they believe. The world is light, and our mind is an elaborately patterned screen. It only lets through what you can perceive. But no, if it were really so, then we would all die of fright during childhood. But I'm a rationalist. I'm a scientist. My world consists of proven and concrete things. It might already be apparent, but the lodger contradicts and lies to himself throughout most of the story due to him trying to hold on to his outlook of life. That's why it's so easy to get lost in the dialogue. It isn't straightforward. This is the mind of a troubled man who is slowly losing his sanity. The only one who can help save him from himself is the invisible one. She was always there, playing in the woods, living in nature, and maybe even sometimes visiting the house. She was 
confused as to why the Lodger viewed the outside world so negatively. Well, she didn't find anything particularly awful about it, and that's what she was trying to tell him. The forest he walks around and believes is real actually isn't. It's also a part of his imagination. The real forest is actually out there, and it's not nearly as awful as he imagines it. He has been in isolation for so long that he doesn't even remember how the outside world really looks like, and is stuck in his own nightmarish cycle. The Invisible One slowly watched him go deeper and deeper into insanity, and decided to help him the only way she could, by leaving him these notes. While viewing these notes, the Lodger makes his decision, whether to ignore the fragments of reality, all of the memories of his past that he can't seem to remember properly, and listen to his own thoughts instead, or fight against himself and face everything he's ever believed to be dangerous towards him in a different way. I personally think that this particular theory might be the closest we can get to the developer's or to the mysterious email writer's initial vision. It explains almost every bit of the limited information that the game shows us in a little more depth. Overall, I can say that I'm pretty happy with it. This story shows the awful nature of isolation and stubbornness, and what they can do to a person. It's your choice if you wish to go deeper and deeper with your beliefs, or try to view the world from a different perspective. One step forward or backwards can possibly change your life, just like it did the Lodgers. So that's why I think Knock Knock might be the best game you've never played. At the end of the day, we have to remember that games made by Icepick Lodge are usually purposefully made to be vague, and to have multiple interpretations of what certain things are, so that the player would be able to piece together their own story for themselves. The versions of events that I piece together in my eyes seem to be the most logical, and based on the limited information the game gives you, they may or may not be the most accurate, but they're by no means official, and you might have a different way of seeing things, so feel free to disagree with me. My point is, Knock Knock is a special game. It's unique, and maybe even one of a kind. It might not be the best, but if it was really that bad, I doubt I'd be making a video about it. And if you're one of those people who gave it a bad review, hopefully this video might have changed your mind a bit. If not, well, there's really nothing I can do about it. You do you. Either way, thank you guys for watching this video. If you enjoy video essays on different games that I find interesting, make sure to stick around. And if you would like to recommend a game for me to possibly look into for a future video, you can also leave it in my suggestions box on my Discord server. The link is always in the description. And with that said, I guess I'll see you guys later.